going to say again, skills are more important than things. And the first thing that I would say to people is if you really want to get into canoe camping or any kind of camping or whatever it is, start by reading everything in the canoeing literature. When I was a kid, I read every single book that had ever been written on canoeing and camping. Not once, but many times. I could remember and recite passages from them. By doing that, what you do is you set in motion the wheels for understanding what you need and what you don't need. And the truth is, most people spend their money on things they don't need. Watch some people in an outdoor store sometime and see where they're spending their money. They're buying things like cutesy little flashlights, uh, toys, little these toy, toys for state park uh, type things, uh, lanterns, chairs, things that they really don't need. And what they really need are, number one, they need a good tent. That's going to keep the water out. They need a good tarp because you can't be in the tent all the time. They need a, a good sleeping pad so they're going to sleep well at night. What they don't need is a $300 sleeping bag. You don't need it. It doesn't get that cold. You can get by actually with a couple of airy blankets most of the summer. You can buy, you can buy a very nice sleeping bag for $100, $150 that will, that will serve you very well. But some of these things are down on the list. They'll, or they'll buy, uh, they'll buy super expensive clothing right off the bat. Those are nice things too. You need a good rain suit. You need packs. You need decent packs. And remember when you buy a pack, you're probably going to have most of these canoe packs for life. So you don't want to go out and buy something cheap and crummy. You want to spend the money on what you need. But you also want to bear in mind that canoeing is different than backpacking. Backpacking, you're carrying your stuff 20 miles maybe in a day. A long portage in canoeing is a couple of miles. That's a long portage. For that, you don't need dedicated backpacking gear. A backpacker needs just one pack. And if that backpacker spends $400, $500 on a pack, okay, it's a lifetime investment. A canoeist needs three packs minimum, maybe as many as five or six. So if you're going to be spending three or $400 per pack, you better have the money. So I guess what I'm saying is if you do your research, you're going to, decide, you're going to realize that there's no best pack or there's no best item diversity often pays big dividends. So you can have a number of different kinds of packs, uh, a, a number of uh, uh, just basically everything can be can be diverse. Uh, so only buy what you need. Start out small, buy the things that you really need and, and then go from there. And if you're going to rent stuff, that's fine, but rent the best. Spend a little bit more money, go with an outfitter that's going to rent you top shelf stuff. Then you'll see, you'll feel in your hands the difference between a $200 carbon fiber paddle uh, and a, a, a $39 aluminum and plastic paddle. Once you discover that, you'll know where to put your money. Okay, let's talk about what really goes on out there. What really goes, here, here's the dangers, the real dangers. Number one, you are most likely get to get killed driving to and from the wilderness. Car wreck is going to be number one. Number two is open water crossings. You get a mile from shore on one of these, you get a mile from shore in the boundary waters. If the water's cold and you capsize your canoe, you're probably going to die. And people say, well, what do I do if I'm a mile ashore, from a mile from shore and I capsize? What do I do, Cliff? I say, you die. It's as simple as some mistakes you just can't make. Okay. That's, those are the two big ones. Okay, now let's go to number three. Number three would be uh, hypothermia, your camp getting shredded in a storm. Your tent blows down, water gets in your tent, uh, you can't stay warm, everything is wet, uh, and you, you die of hypothermia. Now those are the three big ones. Now if you wanted to add a fourth to this, we could probably uh, come up with a number of accidents. Bears, bears are so far down the list that they don't even count. I mean, even when you, even when you include canoeing in grizzly country and even polar bear country, it, all, it really doesn't count. You occasionally will hear of a mauling, but it's so occasional, you hear far more problems with people capsizing. What about drowning in a rapid? You know, that can happen too, but that's pretty far down the list too. Why? Because where rivers create rapids, they generally tend to be narrow. 
And if you capsize in a rapid and you're wearing your life jacket and you know the procedure, lay on your back and so forth with your feet up in the air, holding your paddle, uh, most people will be able to get to shore and they will be fine. They might be cold, they might be miserable, but they will, they will live through the experience. So let's set this bear thing to rest. Okay, bugs. You know, bugs are what they are, and sometimes uh, they are so horrendous that even those of us who uh, can tolerate them have to die for the tent. But there are some things that you can do to minimize it. Number one, heading the list are avoid colors that bugs like. And what they like is navy blue. That's top of the list. Ironically, most of the stuff you buy in outdoor stores is navy blue. It's the most popular <laughs> color. Don't buy navy blue. Black's not good either. Generally, the lighter colors are better. And it's really quite, quite pronounced. Um, if you're going to use repellents, don't get taken in by clever advertising that's going to tell you how all these natural repellents work. You know what? They don't work. What works is DEET, diethyl made etolumide. And the more of it you have, basically the better it works. There are some exceptions. You can mix it, use cream-based repellents, last longer than alcohol-based repellents and so forth. But basically what works is, uh, what works is DEET. Finally, there are nets. And um, there are head nets. I wouldn't go into the woods without a head net. And by the way, head nets should be black in color so that you can see through them. Um, Horace Capehart uh, and Nesmick said years and years ago that head nets should be black so you can see through them. Any other color reflects light into your eyes. Hello manufacturers, would you get this point please and quit color coding uh, uh, m mosquito nets to match the tent? Make it black so people can see out of it, thank you. Um, then there's also a neat little uh, net designed by my wife Sue Herrings, it's called the Susie Bug Net. It's just basically a, a stock envelope that's sewn up, it's black so you can see through it, you can put it over your head. Especially nice uh, if you're going to go to the bathroom, in the outdoors, you can throw this thing over you and by the way if you have a folding stool, you can just put the folding stool there, you can put the net over the folding stool, you can move away from that and then you can go to the bathroom without getting eaten alive by bugs. Now you can get one of these things, you can buy them from Cook Custom Sewing makes the Susie bug net. I don't know what it costs. You'll also find plans for making it in my books, uh, what, Expedition Canoeing, I think Canoeing and Camping Beyond the Basics, and I think that it, it may be in Camping's Top Secrets, too. So we covered bears, bugs, oh, storms. There's one other thing that we really need to understand. When you buy a tent, unless you buy a very expensive high-end tent, and by that I mean we're talking $500 plus, generally. Okay, If you buy less expensive tents than that, the way you cut weight and the way you cut bulk is in the hardware. You're not going to save a tremendous amount of weight in fabric. You're going to save it by reducing stakes and by making poles flimsier, which means many of these tents are not very storm proof. But you can add storm lines. You can sew things onto your tent. You can add storm lines. Uh, and make your tent stand up in a wind and rain. My video, my Forgotten Skills video, shows how to do that. There are also instructions for doing that in uh, uh, my book, um, uh, Canoeing and Camping Beyond the Basics and, ca and Camping's Top Secrets. Finally, one major thought, if you forget everything else about stormproofing your camp, just remember this, always carry a plastic ground cloth with you and put the plastic inside the tent. Do not put it under the floor. Make the plastic large enough so that it flows up the sidewalls of the tent on all four sides. That way, when, not if, when you get water inside your tent, which you will if it rains hard enough and long enough, the water will be trapped between the plastic and the floor and you will stay dry. If you put the plastic under the tent, this is the same thing as pitching the tent on a slab of concrete. Water will pool between the plastic and the floor and be pressure wicked into the sleeping compartment. So the interior ground cloth is the best tip I can give you about uh, staying, staying dry in a storm. And by the way, it can have a real safety factor too. If you start getting lightning all around and you wind up in a tent that's wet, well, need I say more?